Business is simple. It's just not easy. We focus on three things to help you run and grow your business more easily. Talent, sales, and how to scale. This is the Talent, Sales, and Scale Show. Hey everyone, Brian Whittington with this episode of the Talent, Sales, and Scale Show. Whoa, are you in for a treat today? We got Dave Nelson, who is an awesome speaker. He's a <laughs> award-winning international Vistage speaker multi-time CEO with multiple successful exits and all kinds of crazy things. He even is working on a stealth startup. It's stealth, so we haven't seen it yet. So <laughs> Not that's talking about it today, Brian. Yeah, that's Sorry. Coming the, that's coming down the pike. Um, and he's currently the president of Dialogue Consulting. And the, the, the conversation is, okay, yeah, we went through 2020. You would think at this point, everybody would be completely digitized, that we'd be up and rolling, have all the tools down. And what I found, especially even yesterday, I was with some more, uh, with a group of owners and, and business people outside of the tech space. <laughs> it was like, they didn't even know what Slack was for goodness sakes. So, I mean, there is still so much work to be done. And so that's what we're gonna be talking to today. So welcome to the show, Dave. Thank you, Brian. And let me just say every company should be on some kind of journey to drive internal email to zero in favor of having all employee communication collaboration happen on Slack or Microsoft's very, very, very good copy called Microsoft Teams. And I'm not talking about the video that people are typically aware of on Teams. I'm talking about the channels, the document sharing, the direct messaging. And in fact, people don't know this, but nominally Slack stands for the searchable library of all communication and knowledge. Wouldn't it be cool in your company to have a searchable library of all communication and knowledge? So we're at peak email right now and it's time. Hey, I would, if I were a business person, I'd make my goal six months. Internal email is zero. That's not our topic for today, I think, but I love Slack and Teams is a super good look. Microsoft does not enter every product category. They're here since 2016. Something big has happened. You should be moving. Yeah, and if Microsoft is on it, they're the fast follower. The they, fast they, follower, yep, absolutely. Yep. Great business strategy, by the way, for small and medium-sized businesses. We don't have to be innovators, but we better not wait too long when the innovations are proven. Be that fast follower. Well, let's talk about first, uh, well, I guess the, the first question I always ask Dave is, so why in the world should we listen to, to you about this digitization? I mean, wh what makes you such the expert on this? Well, let's see. Uh, I have done a few different software companies, so I sort of am a, a, a geek and I wear that title proudly. I'm engineer by training. Uh, I don't code anymore. Not really, but I can uh, build good software teams. But um, maybe most relevantly, in 2005, long, long ago, 17 years back as we record this, I started a podcasting company. There were no iPhones back then, which is why it's named podcasting even today, right? We were aiming audio content at, uh, at iPods. And, um, you know, I hired a relatively young team our product was a consumer focused product. Of course, I think it's in the B2B business to business space where we see the largest needs today to embrace this. But right. in any case, I hired a young team and they picked up all of these great uh, modern marketing tools. You know, we were one of the first companies on uh, Twitter. Uh, it had barely even been named Twitter then. It was originally Odeo. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just I learned a lot by doing it and by 2009. I realized that most people in business, whether they're focused on consumers or other businesses or even selling to, say, government, whatever sectors, uh, they didn't know much about this whole social media, inbound marketing, digital marketing kind of stuff. And so I started speaking on it. And since then, I've been with about 2,000 uh, groups, typically 10 to 12 CEOs at a time, mostly medium-sized businesses. And uh, over 100 companies have hired me to help them create their digital marketing strategy. So I am not an expert in any industry, but I've seen so many. And there's certain things that work everywhere. And so uh, that's my background. Uh, it's really a learn by doing as a CEO from a young, smart team of people who picked up things in the early days. And 
you know, I'm not into like being on Facebook because it's cool. I'm on to into uh, the idea of where's the ROI, the return on investment, and uh, that's what I'm going to uh, to focus on. Well, so since 2020, everybody got into the dis- digitization. I mean, you had to. You were slammed into it. It accelerated. Work from home, everything. shelter in place. Yeah, and we're still in remote hybrid and people that are trying to hire right now, if you try to bring people back into the office, unless if you're Tesla and Elon Musk, most people, (laughs) right. Most people are fighting that they don't want to go down that path. And, and so that digitization is even more important. And you talked about knowing these channels through whether it's a communication channels and being specific of contextualizing. Uh, you also talked about document sharing and there's things like Guru and all of these other um, plugins that is doing what I think we should be able to do on our own without these additional plugins. Is that correct, Dave? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I want to start with why, though, just in case somebody's not with us today on this whole idea of hybrid work from home. Just talk a little bit about what's permanent in terms of changes. Uh, we can't say post-COVID because COVID's never really gone, but we can say post-pandemic. We're, fa- we're past that phase. Okay, post so, shutdown, you're right. Yeah, post-pandemic. <laughs> and uh, here are just some things to think about. I want to go down on the record as I'm in favor of hybrid. Not 100% work from home, but also not 100% in the office. And one thing I learned studying operations research way long ago at Stanford is the optimal point is usually not at either extreme. So it's not 100% either. The Probably the best place for most businesses to be, at least for their knowledge workers, it's some kind of hybrid. And uh, the reason is this. The studies show people are more productive eight to 13 percent they're happier so quit rates go down i mean these are things that accrue directly to us as employers you have the ability to add remote talent to your team that might not be available in your geography or maybe it's cheaper uh someplace else you know my son is currently doing digital marketing uh on the paid side google and facebook paid advertising for a company based in la now he's still here in pittsburgh pennsylvania and i bet the la companies say we got mike in pittsburgh for half price right so there's all these reasons that we as employers need to consider this kind of new hybrid digital world we're in and the prediction that i'll leave people with comes out of probably the foremost researcher on work from home His name is Nicholas Bloom, and uh, he said that before COVID, 5% of U.S. workdays were done from home. Post-pandemic, once all this sort of settles out, so in the future, 22% of U.S. workdays will be from home. So we're taking like a 4 to 5x. And if you as an employer are not considering this, if you're doing the Elon Musk thing, everybody's got to be back in the office. One CEO I met recently said, you know, Whenever one of my uh, competitors announces a return to office, RTO policy, (laughs) that's where I point my recruiters. You know, it's just not something we as employers can ignore. But again, not 100% at home, not 100% in the office. So what's that hybrid uh, look like? Is it quarterly basis, annually? How how often are we doing? Because uh, I'm guessing that Mike, your son, isn't jumping on an airplane weekly to go out there. No, LA. no, not at all. And so it really does, it depends on where your workers are. But let's say, let's say they're still all in your geographical footprint. I think you as an employee, there's a benefit to having everybody together some of the time. And so I might have a policy that says, hey, everyone's in the office on Wednesday and Thursday, but work permitting Friday, Monday, Tuesday, you know, you pick wherever works best for you. That's to me sort of the stereotypical hybrid. And uh, we just mentioned earlier Slack or Teams, these kind of tools really enable, they they shine when people are more distributed. And by the way, I gotta point out, even if it's not your, your workforce that's distributed, what we're talking about applies to your customers, your partners, suppliers, we're all gonna have to deal with this regardless of our own team. But that's what I mean by hybrid and Something you might want to go back and check if you haven't looked at it recently is something called ROWE, R-O-W-E, a results-only 
work environment. And it really, the, sort of the key there is, it's about putting in place metrics that people can operate against. And if you think about it, what gets measured gets done, but if people don't understand even the metric that they're working against, <laughs> you know, by the way, you're, you're into sales, right? We do this with salespeople all the time. You have a quota, right? It's everybody knows, you know, are you at, above, below quota? It, it's black and white as to performance. We should be doing that with every job function in a world where everybody is more scattered, more distributed. And so key performance indicators, KPIs for every job function, go look up ROW in Wikipedia, R-O-W-E, it'll get you started. They talk about the four fundamentals for ROW success. But that's what I mean by hybrid, everybody together some of the time. And if you have like really geographically remote workers like my son, Mike, for this LA firm, you know, maybe it's once a quarter people come together for a week, but the rest of the time they're scattered the wind and you as the employer are getting, you know, savings in recruiting costs, you're getting higher productivity, you're getting lower turnover rates, maybe lower real estate costs, so many benefits. But hey, as uh, employers, let's acknowledge the permanent changes that have occurred in the in the world. Now, why hybrid? What what is the what have you seen of hybrid being the key there? I'm not pushing it back against you, but you always have the studies or the, the ways to back this up. Yeah, and it's just that uh, you think about this. Let's take the productivity uh, angle just for a second. Where does productivity come from if somebody's not in the office? Well, when they're in the office. First of all, they put in some substantial time to commuting to and from the office. Yeah. So they're defining that as work time. On the days that they're work at home in that remote mode, they didn't commute. They tend to put that into without it being requested. They've already signed that you know, mental contract. That's time for the company. They're working for you instead of driving. Uh, another place where productivity comes from, when people are constantly interrupted, takes 50% longer to get something done. You're in the office. There are certainly some ancillary benefits to somebody dropping by your cubicle or getting into a long conversation by the water cooler, but that's costing you as an employer productivity. And so the fact that people can stay more on task when they're in a work from home mode, and again, I'm saying some days, not all days, but they're more productive. And in the category of too much information, people are putting less time into personal grooming. And again, that time goes accrues to the employer. So there's all sorts of reasons that people are more productive on some tasks, some of the time when they're not there in the office. And as an employer, I want to benefit that, benefit from that. And they're happier too. So my turnover rate is lower. There's just so many reasons that we can't ignore this. Yeah, and I like the fact of if you're going to have the hybrid and if you're geographically possible to bring people in at the same time, then do it on everyone comes in at the same time because really the, the brilliance of the hybrid is that team camaraderie, the community, the sharing, that water cooler talk that you're otherwise missing. However, we can potentially do some of that on, on this Slack channel or in Teams channel. But if you're going to have people in, I, I've seen a lot of times where people go, well, come in at least twice a week. Well, if you can pick any day, then you might pick days that other people aren't in and you're going to miss that out. So I, I like your approach of having everyone on the same days. And while we're at it from the employer perspective, if I'm paying my landlord for a 500 square foot conference room that, you know, in the past, the you know, whole team was together every week. Three out of four weeks, we're going to do that on you know video now, and maybe one week out of four, I want to bring everybody together. Let's find the local WeWork spot, pay them two hours, and not pay our landlord for the whole month. And so, there's even a chance to rethink our real estate, even though we bring everyone together some days. You can still be more efficient, more effective. And so, new rules. So let's let's adapt to the world. Hey, remember the old. Uh, observation of Charles Darwin. It's not the strongest or most intelligent that survive. It's those that adapt to a changing environment most quickly. Yeah. Hey, the environment has changed. Let's uh, adapt. Well, and let's hit that on the, the adaption. And then I want to come back to uh, identifying the different channels and document sharings and, and the specific things that might work everywhere. So if we can hit those principles, um, you shared with us a really interesting exercise. So as you're, I mean, technology is changing at a 
exponential rate. And <laughs> if you don't get ahead of this and find your niche in this, you're going to go to the way of Blockbuster. So um, can you share with the folks the exercise that you take people through to help them foreshadow opportunities as well as risks so they can find their way through, the, through that? Um, you mind sharing that, Dave? Yeah, and I'll happily jump into it. I do have to say, nominally, <clears throat> we've been building, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Got you all you choked up. <clears throat> You're asking hard questions. Put me on the spot. Hang on one second here. Nominally, I think we're building a great case for why this whole digital thing makes sense. If, if the whole workforce and customer base is more scattered post-pandemic than pre-digital, inbound marketing, you know, online all becomes a whole lot uh, more important. So I think we're doing a good case uh, uh, building the why of this. Now, I have a specific visioning exercise that I like to take people through. And um, why visioning, right? It sounds sort of, you know, uh, I don't know, all loosey-goosey yeah. and future, but here's the thing. If you have a, <clears throat> a better vision for what's coming down the pike, then you can make better business decisions today, better resource allocation, better investment. So I think everybody should have a more concrete you know, three to five year vision, know where you're going so that every step you're taking is going in that general direction. And so I have a three-step process for visioning. Step one is you pull your team together, you tell them what date you're focused on. So, hey, we want to build a three-year vision. So we're focused on, say, as we record here, it's middle 2022. So we're talking middle of 2025. So you set the time frame, And when I say pull your team together, I mean in a pretty broad, diverse sense. None of us is as smart as all of us. And so maybe I'm going to invite in some customers, partners, suppliers. We're going to do it on Zoom. Everybody's hip to, to Zoom or Microsoft Teams video these days. And step one then with the team together and with the time frame specified is just to brainstorm with this group about things that might occur relevant to us in the next three years. And I'm building a list, right? When you're brainstorming, there's no bad ideas. You're not doing any kind of filtering. You're just making a list. And I think you should be brainstorming broadly. I'm all about technology and the technology trends. So there should be somebody, you know, who's representing that viewpoint. But what kind of evolution are you seeing in your customer base, in your supplier base? You know, right now, one of the big trends I'm happy about is people are, uh, you know, this COVID thing showed us how fragile our global supply chain is. A lot of people are starting to rethink where they manufacture and bringing it back to good old North America, where it's a lot closer to home as opposed to, you know, some distant Asian location. Uh, oh, and let's get the Ever Given stuck sideways in the Suez Canal for a week just to prove the <laughs> fragility. Uh, in any case, uh, you're talking about that kind of stuff. Um, the economy, you know, for the first time in a while, we've got inflation to deal with. Uh, are there any legal or regulatory things that, you know, may occur in your space in the next three to five years? Uh, do you want to talk about, hey, we got viruses now, and I'm not talking just biological, I'm talking digital. Do we want to do any kind of visioning? So, so you're brainstorming scenarios, things that might occur in that kind of three-year window, yeah, building your master list. That's step one. And I don't know if this brainstorming, if I'm going ahead of you, but I also liked how you said, you know, how are we getting to places? You know, you look at Ford CEO, where he's expecting people to be able to sleep in their cars because they're autonomous vehicles. So what's that do to airline travel and the, the disaster that is right now with lack of labor and all that other good stuff, the cost of gas going up. So is that at this step? Those are good work? examples of scenarios. Now, okay. I want to get into detail. We'll, we'll use your example on step two. But so step one, the scenario would be Autonomous vehicles are becoming relatively common, you know, in my geography, or gas prices are now, who knows, $10 a gallon crazy. Uh, those are scenarios. And so step one is about identifying potential scenarios. Okay. Now, what you do to go to step two, this is the fun part, and this is the important mental shift. You pick one at a time these scenarios that you want to sort of, sort of play out. And so let's do the autonomous vehicles one. So if we think autonomous vehicles might be a scenario that is uh, important and relevant to our business, likely to occur. By the way, I would put that one at about a five-year time frame. 
But I think in about five years, uh, 2027, middle part of that, well, it'll be relatively common in the major metro areas to see autonomous vehicles. And so if we pick that one, here's, here's the mental shift for step two. Assume it has happened and through the magic of a time machine, you are now in the middle part of 2027, right? We're on a five-year scenario. And you start to talk about, okay, autonomous vehicles are like all around us. And so it happened. And that COVID thing was five years ago. And I saw Brian and David on that podcast or listened to it five <laughs> years ago. Uh, and so now, uh, what are the implications of this world in which we find ourselves? And you have with your same team, that conversation, implications, as if this thing happened. And uh, you would start to, as you already sort of jumped the gun here, Brian, people Sorry sleeping in their that. cars, right? <laughs> if I am speaking in Chicago tomorrow, I might schedule a sleeper config vehicle to pick me up at 10 o'clock tonight and wake up refreshed in Chicago after a, and again, I'm using this word intentionally, eight hour ride, no longer driving, right? Eight hour ride. Most of the time I was sleeping, which I had to do anyway. So there's certain productivity, but notice Southwest Airlines lost a seat, Marriott Hotel lost the night. And of course those economics accrue either to me or some kind of share with the, uh, the, the vehicle uh, company that sent me that uh, sleeper config. But you talk about the other kind of implications of people are productive while riding, where do they live? Do they spend for a, you know expensive apartment in the city center? Heck, where do people park their cars if they don't own their cars? And so you even have implications on like city street capacity being opened up, parking garages being repurposed in, you know, expensive downtown corridors. Uh, 25 to 50% of the, uh, uh, of the ER capacity or typical hospital is related to vehicle incidents, depending on time of day or night, all those doctors freed up to, to, to do better stuff. If I don't own a vehicle, I don't need to stop by Napa Auto Parts, do I? And if these vehicles don't crash as often, it has implications on auto body shops. And it's interesting, as, as with a larger team, I was just riffing on a bunch of these things for you, but with a larger team, when you do this, what happens is it starts to reveal step three, the opportunities and threats, but now with a three to five year lead time, when you can... Uh, address them, diversify your business or divest or expand or whatever it happens to be. And the timing on these steps, normally 15 minutes of brainstorming, 30 minutes working out the scenario, like the autonomous vehicles as if happened. And then you got three to five years to work on the implications, the opportunities and threats that have been revealed. So this is a really good way to bring a team into sort of a common vision of what that more probable future looks like all to the end of making better business decisions today so i think everybody should have a um, three or five year kind of vision and given the rate of change in the world 10 years i think is like a fool's errand but uh, <laughs> three or five years i think that's possible and i've worked that process that we just outlined there with a whole bunch of different companies and it really does heck you know brian i've done my various startups in part, they existed and I got funding because I did that same kind of visioning. And when you can talk to an investor about what a future looks like in a compelling, believable way, and of, of course, how you're going to skate to where the puck is going to be, as Wayne Gretzky might say, uh, they will open their wallets. And so I've raised $70 million in funding and it's really by that same process. So way back in 1998, our telecom networks were designed to carry voice traffic and they were completely circuit or connection oriented. What my co-founder Andy Fraley and I saw was networks were moving to a, uh, first of all, to carry data. And today, of course, they're all designed not for voice, but for data. Voice is like this tiny sliver of bits on our data networks these days. But they were also moving from deterministic circuit oriented to packet-based IP, the internet protocol, which meant that they're statistical, they're not predictable in the same way. And so with the change from voice to data and from circuit to packet, we saw the need for new tools for planning these telecom networks. And we ultimately, ultimately built such a product, but also were able to convince investors to invest major tens of millions of dollars in funding to create such a product. And 
our first major sale was to Sprint, $5.5 million, right? Because they had pain, they had problems. And when you can be there at the right time before other people to solve pain or problems, they'll spend. That's a nice way to differentiate yourself, right? Be, be ahead of everywhere else because you've already thought through this. And my guess is, and I, I didn't realize that you were bringing in in that brainstorming session that you were bringing in um, vendors and maybe clients and really getting a, a diverse set of thoughts in there, um, ones that are maybe in the know in certain areas so they can tease out their area of interest and expertise. And I, that's likely the most important part of this, I would think. Yeah, I just want to say in general, diverse teams are smarter. And uh, if you doubt this, uh, McKinsey, the world's most prestigious consulting firm, has a series of ongoing reports they update about every two years on uh, measures, profitability measures, uh, with respect to team diversity. And so all I'm doing is playing on a proven uh, <laughs> axiom let's let's build when we want when we want to do something hard let's build a more diverse team and since everybody does video now you know this is another big change before the pandemic peak usage on zoom was 10 million people a day four months into it it was 300 million people a day so this is a, this is a permanent and by the way microsoft teams you have 270 million people there so you can essentially assume everybody in business knows how to video conference now and that was not the case in 2019 which means to assemble a diverse team to do an exercise like the visioning exercise that we're talking about far more practical people don't have to jump on a plane which you know the level of cost and time commitment productivity to do that you're not going to get everybody but if hey it's an hour on zoom you got a shot yeah and you can even go international where you're going to add to the diversity and get their perspective so i absolutely love that now so we do that we do this these visioning steps and we go now into the digitization. All right, so we have our vision. We know where we're going, right? So whether we're using Vern Harnish's scaling up or Patrick Lencioni's advantage or uh, Pat or what? Who's um, Patrick or not Patrick Lencioni? What's the uh, traction EOS? Who's that guy? Oh yeah, Wickman, Gina uh, Wickman. Um, yeah, so Gina Wickman's EOS, right? So whatever we're doing there, we now have that vision identified. And we have this remote team. So let's step back to where we we're talking originally, Dave, in those channels, doc sharing, and the key fundamentals that are the foundation for digitizing our world. So can we work now from the point we have this vision, what do we do with it to have this remote hybrid team come together and communicate well? Yeah, so uh, you know the big return, I think, when we talk about... Uh, these tools is applied internally to improve communication collaboration. So I'm glad we sort of came back to this point. I do have to put a, a quick commercial in for EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system. The world that I live in with these, you know, SMB, small, medium sized businesses, that's a hot thing. A lot of people are seeing a lot of benefits. So if you as a business person listening to or watching this haven't really discovered the book traction or the whole idea of EOS, that's probably something worth checking out. Working for a lot of people, definitely a big hot trend. You know, more accountability, more productive, more pro uh, productivity, et cetera. Well, it gets to, to your, your point. Uh, I was just ahead, gonna say, it, it goes to your point of that row, results only work environment. Um, I, I put together what's called a success map. So if you go to YouTube and look up success map, Brian Whittington, um, you can find it there, but that was based on those three to identify those key performance indicators. Most people don't know how to measure success. And if you only look at the lagging indicator, what did you sell from a sales perspective or what did you code? How much did you code from an engineering perspective? That's going to be too late. What are those leading indicators? How are we measuring success and what numbers can you put to it? And if you do those things, you're going to be in a much better space. So wholly agree with you there. <laughs> You reminded me of one of my uh, favorite acronyms. Uh, you know, a lot of times in a digital world, people are looking at, uh, you know, number of hits on their website. Uh, the, the acronym HITS stands for How Idiots Track Success, right? <laughs> if, if, if people aren't engaging on your website, and if you're running Google Analytics for free, I mean, turn it on at least, 
you can click into Google Analytics and look at your engagement numbers. And it's only engaged visitors that count. And so you got to measure the right things. Now, to your question, you were sort of alluding to uh, you know channels and document sharing and collaborating in a, a digital world. To me, the, there's a hundred things that make Slack or Microsoft Teams very equivalent products, by the way. If you're already a Microsoft shop, pretend I never said Slack. But uh, one of the things that is uh, really revolutionary about it, unlike an inbox where it's a single monolithic stream, we have these things called channels. And so as employers, we've got to think about what kinds of things do our people work on and talk about and then create corresponding channels for those things. And then when you're in a channel, it's about that topic. You're on that topic. Your brain does a lot less task switching. And uh, there's just so many things, you know, until you try it, you won't appreciate just how big an idea that is. But then that brings us to the key question. What should our channels be? How many should we have? And that is a strategic decision. So if you're new to this whole Slack or Microsoft Teams thing, play around a little bit, get some volunteers, put them in a sandbox and experiment with the channels and see what feels right. A lot of companies like to have channels on a per project basis. Uh, in my uh, previous software company, there's only a hundred potential global customers, you know, Sprint, at and Wireless, maybe you have a channel per customer. If you are running a franchise operation of 50 uh, pizza places around the city, maybe a channel per location, and then one more channel for all the managers across the 50 locations so that you're sharing knowledge. You, could, uh, you know, do you have channels by department? So there's a marketing channel, sales channel. Uh, there's so many ways to create channels that I would say it's going to be different for every company. It relates to your corporate culture, etc. But experiment a little bit. And in the end, you want not too many channels because you fragment things. People never know where to look for something, but not too few. It degrades back into uh, an inbox. And the real problem with email relative to how our human brain operates is every message is a task switch, a context switch from what comes before because they're just sort of chronological, not topic oriented like channels. And that's just a very inefficient way in email for us to, to work. So channels bring a lot of benefits. And then the other part of this, Brian, is that we're also putting our direct messaging into this same platform. So instead of using a random hodgepodge of six tools, you know, some people high messaging, some SMS, hip chat, WeChat, WhatsApp, Skype, whatever, uh, we're going to put all our communication in one place. So the direct messaging goes into our system as well. So if it's team oriented, it's a channel communication. If it's person to person, small groups, it's, uh, you know, direct messaging. And then the other thing that makes this revolutionary, well, let's see, two things. There's only going to be one copy of a document. So we share a document on a channel and then we collaboratively edit, you know, it's change tracked and change controlled and all that kind of stuff. So we're not keeping documents on our own machines anymore. There's one copy on the cloud. And so there's essentially one known uh, truth in the yeah, company. One version of the truth, exactly. <laughs> right, one version of the truth. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this environment, Teams or Slack, is a closed, encrypted, protected environment with initially only our people in our workspace, which means that it's safe and secure. And so you can leave the channels open. They don't have to be open, but I would counsel you to leave as many open as you can. So if sales wants to look at what marketing is working on, go look at the marketing channel. This creates a transparency, which then creates two other things. When there's transparency of what everyone is doing, everyone becomes more accountable and there's a whole lot more trust. And hey, those that's, that's a game changer from a corporate culture perspective. So when you adopt Teams or Slack and you eventually get everyone on it, we're not talking about the hard part here and that is the behavior change, right? I'm giving you a great easy tool, doesn't cost very much. <laughs> I'm not helping you with the behavior change here and I'm not going to, That's I assign that to you. But if you can get everybody on it and leave it mostly open to the team to see, it just, it completely changes corporate culture. 
And, uh, you know, that, that, those are the whys. And uh, here's another why. You will find you need far fewer meetings in your company when you're communicating in this mode because everybody's just sort of in the know. And if by chance the bad thing happens and somebody leaves, you turn off their access the new person joins, you provision them onto the project channel, and there's the whole history of the project from day one. And so it's a much better way to preserve institutional knowledge and ramp new people as they join. And it's just like, as I said before, there's a hundred things that make this better than email. So we should all be on that journey in a world where people are more distributed. So digital is more important than it used to be. Yeah. So a couple of things off of that. I completely transformed our business into one of uh, of digital based upon what they've suggested so the change management is a challenge so you as the leader of this when somebody emails you slack them or message them in teams say hey can you send that to me in teams so hey, i saw email. your email right yeah. before i deleted it could you please <laughs> repost it on the slack channel and you might even get into after you've given everyone a sufficient time to adapt if they're coming along slowly announce a new policy company-wide hey if you get an email from another employee uh please walk down to their office and find them one dollar it is your duty once people have to start paying even a nominal price to send emails they're uh they're gonna get with the system yeah exactly and then the other side of that is once you set up these channels to go to what you said about reducing meetings i was finding that everybody was coming to me and, and I, if we have this, we have these team channels, go to the people within the team. You don't need me. If you need me to solve the problem, then what I, why did I hire you? Right. You, you guys figure it out. I'm within the team's channel so I can follow along, but communicate with one another. I, if I need to make the decision, then I'm doing a poor job as a leader. You, I've empowered you to do this, work it out together. Let me know. I do have veto power, but I trust you. So, I mean, there's so much that can happen in there. It allows better communication within the organization, more autonomy, more engagement, because now they're empowered to actually work together and make decisions. And you'll find leaders start to come out of the team. And those are the people that you end up promoting. So there's just so much good stuff. You could probably even add a lot more than that. No, I 100% agree. And along the same lines, if um, I have to get you in the office and watch you to, for you to get your work done, you were not the right person for me to hire. And so, yeah, I, I we're in raging agreement, Brian. Now, how about document sharing? Because there's all of these other tools out there that are to help identify, find these, these different um, documents. And that's the challenge, right? you have all of these documents, all the different versions of the truth. And you're like, oh, I made this thing one time. What in the world was it? So how do we do a better job with that? Okay, so uh, the first big idea I want to suggest there is that we, we need to start moving away from something that has served us well. <laughs> and that is the idea of, uh, I call it hierarchical thinking, but I'm talking folders within folders within folders and manually trying to find our documents. Most people that I meet have not really learned the power of, they, they know the power of Google, but they don't know the power of the search tools in the systems they're using. And that could be really being competent at searching at a Windows or Mac level, or searching within Slack or Teams or whatever your tool is, spend an hour really learning how the search works because if you think about it there's a huge cost to managing documents within folders uh, one part of the cost is it's relatively slow you know click 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 but the bigger cost is that information is not one dimensional and yet a folder-based hierarchical system forces us to put everything in one place and then we generally don't find it when we go looking for it in fact, Microsoft did an interesting- I would take out generally there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Microsoft did a study recently. It was called the Innovator's Guide to Modern Note-Taking. But one of the things that struck me was 76 hours per employee per year 
you know, mucking around with folders. That's and so I, I got it right. Sounds low, doesn't it? One to two hours a week. And so what we're talking about here is an opportunity to add two weeks per year of productivity on a per employee basis. When you move away from the hierarchy and you really learn to use the search tools. So that's sort of the, the big idea. Now to bring it all home, one of the cool things, if you're a Microsoft Teams user and you set up your channels, first of all, here's a big hint. Uh, your channels probably are very similar to your top level folder structure yeah. on your computer, right? Of course, we have to come up with a standard that everyone, you know, works for everyone at best it can. But um, you will notice when you click into a channel on Microsoft Teams, there are some tabs visible in your window. And one of those tabs says files. And right above it is a search box. And so your files get grouped by channel. And I don't think people need any more hierarchy than that. Just put everything in that channel in a giant pile and learn to use the search function. And you just got back 75 and a half hours per person per year. So to me, that's the big idea. Abandon the hierarchy, master search, and then use the search capabilities in Teams or Slack or whatever your system is. I, I love Evernote, but whatever it is, uh, become search competent. That That is the requirement to be a successful employee or leader in business today, in my opinion. So it's funny, right? Well, I don't, I don't have time to learn that. Okay. Right, of course. <laughs> right, because you're spending 76 hours a year looking for things manually. And by the way, when you look for things manually, you're using folder name and file name. This is metadata, data about the data, but you're not using anything that is the data itself, the content within the document. When you tap into these modern search tools, they do content level indexing. They can you know, look at a scan or a photograph and use the magic of optical character recognition to make the words searchable. In other words, when you're engaging with search at a content level, you're, you got like a thousand more ways to find something than just this little sliver of metadata that is a folder name or file name. And then my favorite thing when I search and get results that are content level search, you sort them by date last changed. So all the new stuff is at the top of that list. And that's what you're probably looking for. So you would be amazed. I spend like zero time organizing. And yet I would uh, strike you as one of the most organized people. You tell me what you want. I can show it to you in like two seconds. And so this is, again, another behavior change, right? And this is part of our job as leaders, right? To show people, to give them the why, to give them the training and, uh, you know, set that path forward. And so in adopting Slack or Teams, we also need to be adopting search. And here's where I could talk for the whole rest of our podcast, Brian, but the one thing that people are going to discover that is probably an unseen revolution out there is this idea of tagging. I you was can just going to add, I, Mark, yeah, the note you, there, you want to bring that up. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you can, you can add a tag or a keyword to a document. And if you doubt this, go into the Save As dialog on Microsoft Word, look carefully along all those fields. And if you're using Office 365, you'll see there's a field for tagging. And so now you add keywords that also aid in finding things in search. And let me give you a simple example of, uh, of a tag. So I keep like I keep everything in uh, my search tool, which I alluded to earlier, Evernote. But again, this isn't really about Evernote. It's about the idea of tagging. And so I have tax documents going back to 1994. And every once in a while, I like to look up an old 1040. You know, I have something I'm digging into. And here's the problem. If you try to search on the term 1040, that's an extremely common term. It's referenced in all the instruction documents and it's probably on, you know, like everything. And it might even randomly just be in some string of numbers. So it is by and large a worthless search term. But if you use 1040 as a tag instead, so every time I post one of my 1040 uh, documents, you know, I just did this, right? We just did 2021 tax year taxes. I put the final returns into my file management system. I put a tag 1040 on them. And now I can say I'm searching not for the word or phrase or number 1040, but for a tag 1040 
that greatly reduces the search space that can add in then maybe 2021, which will as a number appear on the document. And boom, I've got the result. And so it turns out these tags are super handy. And at one level, you're probably thinking, well, I could make a folder for all the 1040s. And that's <laughs> true, but here's the thing. There are other ways you might wanna find this, other folders that you might potentially wanna put this in and duplication would be a nightmare. So you don't want multiple copies of the same document. You never know if you have the current version and you're cluttering up your world, but you can always add another tag. So if you wanna find something two ways, you don't put it in two folders, you put two tags on it, then whichever one occurs to you, you find it. And again, I described all this and you're probably not getting why this is such a big idea. You gotta try it out. You gotta start to investigate and play with the tags. To me, that is this huge revolution out there. And pretty much every piece of software today, including Mac and OS at a operating system level, support the idea of tagging. Use it. Yeah, absolutely. It. Now, how about naming conventions? Should we be using any naming conventions or do tags make up for that? They make up for most of it. But uh, again, you still do have the idea of naming conventions. And so this is where... Every company is going to be different. I'm giving some advice, but your mileage may vary. Uh, if a naming convention helps, fine. But you're not going to solve every problem with a naming convention unless you have file names that are about a thousand characters long. Right. And so come up with a, you know, a light naming convention, a light hierarchy, which by the way is just files by channel. That's that's probably as much hierarchy as you need, and uh, then supplement with tags and really start to, the real power of all this is the content level search and the date last change sorts and those kind of things. Uh, you know, so if you wanna have a light naming convention, have at it, but that don't try to solve every uh, document retrieval problem at the naming level or at the folder level. There's so much more that you can use. And uh, again, as leaders, we gotta get our whole team on the same kind of path so that we recapture that lost productivity. This, yeah, and, the whole idea of folders was great until we got really good search, but hey, news flash, we got really good search and we've got tags, etc. And you can't use your lack of technology. You can't use your lack of understanding. That's I, I'm so glad you made that point. Look, every company today is a technology company. You may not be selling a technological end product or service, but technology is how we get it done. It's where the productivity, the collaboration, the profit comes from. And so in my opinion, if as a business person or especially business leader, you're, you're generally like, I'm a boomer, I don't do technology. That's an outrageously dangerous leadership strategy in a technological world. We're going up this exponential curve of technology, and I'm talking, you know, AI, robotics, blockchain, the Internet of Things. This is part and parcel to being a business person today. And so you can't afford an I don't do technology kind of attitude. Correct. Nor hire In any. Right. Exactly. Or hire people like that. Right. And so, you know, it gets back to adapt or die, uh, which is sort of a blunt way to put it. So I always like to lead with the carrot, but ultimately there's the stick there too. The world has changed and the rate of change is accelerating. And so let's get into that. Our job now is to ride the curve, to ride the change and to be ever more adaptable, to be co <clears throat> continuous learners. I think that's really a key idea. Yeah. And um, yeah, if people don't wanna come along with that, I'm gonna make them available to my competitor. <laughs> exactly. And use your visioning exercise so you're not riding the curve, you're getting ahead of the curve because it's ultimately, can you stay ahead of the curve because everybody else, that's how you're gonna make the, the differentiation, right? Is, is being able to keep up with that technology and have your team being more productive because that productivity is gonna out hustle everyone out without burning them out, without adding additional labor, without, right? So it's use what you already have to be more efficient. Absolutely. You remind me that Henry Ford once said, if I ask my customers what they want, they say faster horse. Yeah. Now I, I researched it a little bit and he apparently never said that, but I think 
the idea of customer conversations is still super important, but you don't ask them what they need because they don't necessarily know because they haven't necessarily done the visioning. So to me, the interesting customer conversation is about where is the pain, where are the problems in your business, and then that becomes the input to your visioning exercise. And when you see how you can solve customer pain or customer problems, now you've got something that is uh, what you ask them, not what do you need? A hundred percent. So I, I think that hits the things that work everywhere, which is uh, tags, searching that uh, the channels where you're going to have transparency, which is going to drive accountability, trust within the team. And then one copy of a document, yeah. known truth, right? These, these are really big ideas, but all possible with these new systems that we've got. And like you pointed out, they will work everywhere if we have a culture of adaptation, of learning, and that way we can continue up. Well, oh my gosh, we could go all day because knowing you, Dave, you have, oh, so you'll have to meet Dave at some point because he has all of these tools and tactics and unbelievable amounts of um, of resources. So you'll have to check them out here, but let, let's rapid fire these last couple of questions here. Um, when people try to move into this digitization, what are the biggest challenges that you see or the biggest mistakes that you see people make that slows that process down or might even kill it altogether? Yeah, so here's what I think is the, the top problem that we should all acknowledge. We are all 100% busy, right? So we are this much occupied. And now you're gonna ask me to do something new and anytime I do something new, it's gonna be a productivity hit at first. Yeah. Now, somewhere is a wonderful gain over there, right? But uh, first I gotta go through that, uh, call it the valley of death, right? Where I was already 100% busy and now you're taking down my productivity. And so the, it's a hard question, but the question that maybe you start with is what could we stop doing? What is it that we're doing today that's maybe not as effective as before? Uh, one of the masters of this was Steve Jobs. Every year he would pull his team together and they would identify the three key priorities for the next year at Apple. And then anything that didn't align with those three became part of the stop doing list. In fact, Warren Buffett makes a list of the top 10 things he should be doing next. Then he draws the line at three and numbers four through 10 do not do at any cost, right? <laughs> and so I grant you this is hard, but if you can figure out what to stop doing, now you've cleared the way for your team to take that productivity hit to invest in learning the new thing. So we got to recognize that we can't just throw another log on the fire when they're already 100% occupied. And then I'm going to go back to uh, Simon Sinek and Daniel Pink. Always start with why, right? If you have a powerful why, and so the studies show that the, the companies, the teams using this new mode of communication, 27% uh, fewer meetings, 39% improvement in collaboration, 52% uh, improvement in speed of information. And by the way, that's another Microsoft study you can look up. That's, those are to me the powerful whys. And here's a quick trick. People are not super motivated by gain compared to avoiding loss. And so the way I would frame this one to my team is this. Hey, do we want our competitors to be all over this new Slack thing and have fewer meetings than us, 39% uh, better collaboration than us, 52% faster access to information than us, right? We don't get to stay in business, right? So you frame things negatively as opposed to positively, it's more motivating, but always start with why and clear a little bit of time for them to learn, invest in the training, invest in the time. In fact, now that we're all hip to Zoom or Teams video, why not start at every single Friday, 15 minute lunch and learn for your team, right? Where you could continually feed them new things. And look, the beauty of what we're doing right now, Brian, is it's recorded. So somebody who can't be here live to watch us or to watch my Friday lunch and learn at noon, you got the video, go watch the video. And so those are the kinds of things I think we have to do. There is a productivity valley of death that has to be crossed. And that's my best advice for getting through it.
Love it. And that just reiterates what you suggested earlier with traction EOS or Vern Harnish's scaling up or uh, Patrick Lencioni's The Advantage. That's going to give you your critical few key things to focus on and doing it on a quarterly basis before you get a little bit wonky um, to align with those three major milestones for that year. Um, awesome. Now, how about your, your suggestions for hiring the right talent to be able to do this or scaling the biz, doing this to be able to better scale, scale the business. Any suggestions there? Yeah, there's probably, you know, a, a whole hour <laughs> on the topic <laughs> you just asked, but let me just throw out a couple of things real quick. Yep. Uh, I think the most talented people currently have jobs. I'm stereotyping a little bit so to take nothing away from anyone who's in a job search, but generally, the superstars are in a position that they like they're currently employed i gotta go steal them from somebody else to make the case for why to come to us and so i think linkedin as a tool you know it's your directory of a players if we can put it that way proactively go after you know the best of the best make the case why they should join your organization you know maybe it's a promotion maybe it's a more interesting project maybe it's just time for a change but proactively go after those that you know are currently employed, fight that battle. So that's one thing. And then I'm a, a huge fan of something called behavioral interviewing. Yeah. And so behavioral interviewing is about going after people that have already proven they can do what you need to have done. And so the way a behavioral interview works is you don't tell, you don't ask people hypothetical questions. You know, hypothetically, how would you solve this problem X? Instead, it goes more like, tell me about a time when you did. And um, unlike mutual funds, uh, past performance is a pretty good indicator of future results with humans, right? And so uh, that's the sort of the bottom line on BI or behavioral interviewing. So find people that have already proven they can solve the kind of problems that you're going after and then bring them in and have them do your thing. Now, I do want to point out A players, if we can use that terminology, uh, A players can work anywhere they want. And so there's a lot of things that you got to do to create an environment that A players value. And one of those is the opportunity for continuous improvement, which gets back to the whole point we we're talking about, about continuous learning, right? All these things start to align. I'm going to bring in people who not only engage in continuous learning for my benefit, but for their benefit, right? That all these things are important to building a high performance team, a team that you, you know, attract the best, retain the best. Oh, one other quick thought, Brian, you know, A players recognize other A players, right? They like to be around other A players. I would absolutely have some kind of incentive system for my employees referring, uh, a players into my organization and uh you know back in my telecom software company we had a standing bonus five thousand dollars if you refer somebody in they can make it through our recruiting process you know which is a hard process you get five thousand dollars and so i just engaged my high performance people in finding other high performance people and that's uh you know that's a, one more way to do it a lot less expensive than using an outside recruiter yeah, I wasn't going to say that because we might have some outside recruiters who I love. Scott, Anthony, I love you guys, but, uh, you know, um, yeah, a lot less expensive. Yeah. So uh, proactively recruiting, using behavioral interviews. Uh, one thing that you didn't mention, definitely tie a scorecard to it. So if you do those three things, plus incentive for, for, uh, for referrals of talent, those A players, because Eagles fly with Eagles, as they say. Uh, you're going to do a lot better there. So love all of those. Now, how yep, about and LinkedIn um, is your proactive recruiting tool? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Because that's the other challenge, right? Recruiters, they used to be their network. Now everybody has a network called LinkedIn. Everybody has a network called Indeed. So you, we as recruiters, because that's part of the, what we do is recruiting sp st specifically for salespeople. We as recruiters need to proactively change how we're doing things because Absolutely. everything is now a, a, a level playing field. Um, hey, throw out a quick idea. You know, I once had a, um, somebody I worked with in the past, uh, they messaged me on LinkedIn, said, hey, Dave, we're looking for a new VP of engineering who have you worked with along the way that's like really, really good? And, uh, you know, I value my relationships on LinkedIn. And I try to respond, heck, we're talking because we were messaging each other yeah. on LinkedIn. Uh, so I try to always be a good uh, networking partner on LinkedIn. I responded to this inquiry with seven great people 
I didn't check to see if they're available. That's her job. But seven people that would make a great VP of engineering. And, uh, you know, so just that kind of informal query, working your own network is yet one more way to bring the best people to your, I'm very confident if she hired any of those seven, she would be well served. And I'm willing to put my credibility on the line for that one. And it's probably because you saved 76 hours of not having to search through <laughs> folders to be able to do, to make those relationships, right? Exactly. Now, how about um, different books, podcasts, guides that you might suggest that we can get, you know, at a baseline level to be not anywhere close to as smart as you, but to figure some of this out. All right. I got one for you. I mean, I got a lot. I'm a huge fan of audiobooks, right? Because we all have time to listen and learn when we're driving or exercising or mowing the lawn. So I think everybody should either learn how to get an audio book out of the public library onto your device or just pay $15 to Amazon for their audible.com service and start listening to a lot of audio books. We're talking digital today nominally. That's one of six Ds that's about to crush your business. The other five, you can read about them in a book called Bold by Peter Diamandis. Now, if you're not familiar with Peter Diamandis, he is Mr. Singularity University, Mr. X Prize, one of the most forward focused humans. And uh, I would just suggest the first three chapters of Bold are a really good overview of the six Ds. Oh, one of the other ones, disruption. Yeah, be the disruptor as opposed to the disruptee. But you're going to love the first three chapters of Bold. You've got time to listen to it. You can bump up the playback speed maybe to 1.5, which, frankly, not only is it faster, but two, I love it. Uh, to listen to this stuff faster, I think, improves retention. Your mind doesn't have the chance to wander. It focuses. And so you start there. And Peter also has a podcast called Exponential Wisdom. So go subscribe to that one as well. And make sure you subscribe to Brian's podcast while we're at it. Uh, I love it. Thank you, sir. And then how about, um, what's the future hold? What's coming down the pike that has you like, oh, uh, like a little bit nervous or this is going to be awesome. Well, I'll tell you, um, just to give you a hint of what my new startup is focused on, everybody is overwhelmed with the amount of information that they're dealing with in their business. Mm -hmm. And it's on too many devices in too many places. And so I aim to try to attack that problem. So we'll just uh, we'll leave it at that. Google has solved the internet search problem, but what about all our own stuff? And so that has me excited. Um, I'm super into the internet of things. Uh, we think in about one decade, there'll be 80 billion such devices in the world and about 40% of those will be in our businesses. So if you're not tracking IOT, uh, you probably should be because that's going to impact a lot of businesses. Um, I think another super important development that people should at least be paying attention to is blockchain. Yeah. Not the cryptocurrencies that run on the blockchain, but the actual technology that is the blockchain, because here's what it does. It allows humans to interact without a central mediator or central authority. In other words, for the first time ever, ever, we have technology that brings the trust to, uh, you know, ecosystem of humans that aren't all trustable. And um, now, I mean, to point to a cryptocurrency, think about something like Bitcoin. There is no like full faith of US government or Federal Reserve that stands behind that. And yet people still deem a Bitcoin worth tens of millions of dollars. There's no central authority. To me, it's not about the cryptocurrencies. It's about the underlying blockchain technology. And uh, the thing is, a lot of business exists to be that trust central authority, and that adds uh, cost and potential corruptibility if we want to, you know, Federal Reserve can print more dollars if they want to. It's called quantitative easing, but it ultimately leads to inflation. There's bad things about central authorities, including the cost they bring. And uh, I think a lot of businesses are going to be disrupted because of blockchain, so learn what it is and start to look at the implications for your, your business. And don't buy cryptocurrencies unless you love gambling. Total <laughs> crapshoot right now, right? There's over 10,000 cryptocurrencies and we probably need like five or two or one, I don't know. And so uh, it's too early to be an owner. But the underlying technology to me is super interesting, super exciting. Yeah, because you, you talk about your visioning exercise. Um, this could disrupt whole entire governments, 
whole entire communities because insurance, you, right? Yep. I mean, just real estate. Uh, if you're running a title search company, I mean, these things should be on your radar screen. Uh, very, very good point. All right, Dave, this has been awesome, even better than I was anticipating. And I was anticipating awesome. So awesome squared. Um, so who should reach out to you? How should they do it? And why should people reach out to you, Dave? Well, first of all, uh, trying to reach me on email, you might get a response in 24 to 48 <laughs> hours. But I am Dave at dialogueconsulting.com. Uh, by the way, I never would have picked the domain name Dialogue Consulting if I knew there were two common spellings for dialogue. <laughs> One I use is D-I-A-L-O-G, which technically describes what your computer is doing when it pops up a message. You add the UE, and that's what we're doing right now, Brian. So the short form of Dialogue Consulting, that's also my website, dialogueconsulting.com. But better yet, probably dangerous, but I'm going to put my mobile number out there. Just text me if you want a quick response and you want to chat about something. And that is 412-779-2788. Text me. And uh, maybe we'll connect then on LinkedIn or who knows, the Vistage Network or what have you. But uh, always happy to have a conversation. I believe in networking. I believe in positive karma. I'm going to pay it forward. So don't be a stranger. Yeah. And, and Dave's truly authentic uh, in just being an awesome guy. So reach out to him. Hey, thanks, Dave. I can't thank you enough. So get your digitization on, right? Know your channels, document sharing. Um, these things work everywhere. Think about hybrid specific days per week, get them in, find that eight to 13% more productivity. Um, get your row, right? Results only work environment. Get your visioning steps to identify all of this. Let's implement one of the operating systems that we've discussed and let's not do hits and avoid that. So speaking of hits, let's make sure, go ahead. I got to say one last thing, Brian. We just talk about way too many things. And I believe in business, it's better to do one thing well than two things poorly. So let me suggest after you've watched all this, pick one thing and proceed on that journey and do it well. And not everything you try is going to work. So fail fast, that's fine. And then pick the next thing. But uh, as they say, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, one step at a time, one thing at a time, you'll feel a lot less overwhelmed. So apologies if we threw too many things out there, pick one. Yeah, and that's exactly where I was going, right? So knowledge for knowledge sake is pointless. Knowledge for application thing. What's the one thing that you're going to take and apply from, from this? So wholly agree with you. So like us, share us, comment on this. We really appreciate your time here. And until next time, see you.